Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga, the book that changed my life. We are now at the end of the fourth chapter. And this is 24th episode. And in the previous episode, we looked at uh, the path of devotion, where the central faculty used is the heart and its emotions to come in contact with the divine. And this path utilizes the emotions and its intensification as a means to come in touch with the divine. And it uses all human relationships and turn its focus on the divine. Instead of looking at a mundane relationship, we look at everything from that point of view and turn towards the divine. And through that, it is possible to realize the divine not only in the transcendence, but also in the manifest world as all beautiful, all loving, all blissful. So an integral approach is possible even through that when it is followed not too exclusively as a seeking of that which is transcending the universe, but also embracing the world as the manifestation, as a play, as a lila. So now we move on to the path of works. The path of works aims at the dedication of every human activity to the supreme will. The Karma Yoga, the path of works, utilizes this faculty of will which is necessary for action in the world. There is an active will in us, an intelligent will that responds to all the external contacts. There is a will to do, a will to progress, will to accomplish, will to win. There is this strong will. So we have these three fundamental faculties. One is will, the other is love as we have seen, third is knowledge. So knowing, loving and willing, will to act. Power dimension, dimension of love, dimension of knowledge. These are three fundamental dimensions of the being. So being as knowing, has enjoying through love and doing through work. So here the third dimension, the will come into the picture. So the path of works aims at the dedication of every human activity to the supreme will. We are dedicating every activity to the supreme will. There is a divine will in the universe. We have our little individual will. We have given that certain freedom of individual will, but we dedicate this individual will to the divine will, the supreme will in the universe. It begins by renunciation of, the, of all egoistic aim of our works. Our normal activities, we apply our will to serve the needs of the ego, I, me, and myself. My success, my victory in the world, my goals, my achievement, my growth, my ambition. That is the main motivation behind normal action. The will serves ego. So it begins by renunciation of all egoistic aim of our works. So the work has its aim. If it is egoistic, if it is serving the ego, we need to renounce these egoistic aims. So all pursuit of action for an interested aim or for the sake of the worldly result. So we need to renounce egoistic aims or a specific interest that we are focused on and the worldly result. We, for the, just for the sake of the worldly result. 
all these are to be renounced. So the very attachment to the worldly result and specific interests or the egoistic aims, everything, when our will, the faculty of will serves them, then we get absorbed into the worldly maze. We need to renounce these attachments, these preferences, and take it out. So by this renunciation, it so purifies the mind and the will. So it is through renunciation, it purifies the mind and the will, intelligent will, the buddhi. By this renunciation, it so purifies the mind and the will that we become easily conscious of the great universal energy of the true doer of all our actions. Our normal life, we consider, I am the one who is doing the actions. I am the one who is thinking. I am the one who is hungry. I am the one who is angry. It is all I, me and myself. That is the limited perception of the ego. That is how ego experiences it. But if we look deeper, we know that I am not the one who is making the sun to rise, the wind to blow, the seasons to change externally. That is clear. But internally, if we look deeper, we know that I am not the one who is regenerating the cells of my body, growth of my hair, my nails, replacement of dead tissues, digestion of the food, circulation of blood, all the assimilation. I am not the one who is doing it. But because we have this illusion that since I can think, I can plan, and I can also consciously breathe, I am the one who is the doer. That's a fundamental illusion to be overcome. And once we renounce this notion that I am the doer, then we begin to perceive the universal energy, the universal shakti, the universal mother who is the one who is the worker of the world. Everything is moved by the universal energy, universal shakti. She moves everything. She acts through you, acts through everyone else, acts through every form that exists in the universe. That perception has to arise. So by this renunciation, it so purifies the mind and the will that we become easily conscious of the great universal energy as the true doer of all our actions. And the Lord of that energy as their true, as their ruler and the director with the individual as only a mask, an excuse, an instrument or more positively, a conscious center of action and phenomenal relation. So here we see all three parts. The individual who is an instrument, the universal energy, the Shakti as the worker, and the Lord, the transcendent divine as the master, the Lord, for whom all the works are directed towards. So the and the Lord of that energy as their ruler and the director and director with the individual as only a mask, an excuse, an instrument, or more positively, a conscious center of action and phenomenal relation. So it is, one thing is to see ourselves as an instrument. We are also in a positive term, a conscious center of that divine, who is working in the world, who is working through the Shakti in the world and entering into phenomenal relationships. It is that which is relating to the world through you as a center, a conscious center, where you can you realize that you are only a conscious center of that. The choice and direction of the act is more and more consciously left to this supreme will and this universal energy. 
so here is where once we start renouncing the egoistic aims and recognizing the cosmic shakti, cosmic energy behind the work, and we eventually also leave the direction of the action, purpose of the action to the supreme will. So the choice and direction of the act, like what I will do, what I will not do, what is the right course of action for me? All these are left to the divine to decide and reveal to you. This is the work. Do it. And you do it as a willing servitor of the divine consciousness. You know yourself as an instrument of the divine and surrender to the divine will. You no more struggle with your little egoistic individual will. It is when we lean towards the ego will, we struggle. But in the path of Karma Yoga, you realize and recognize the divine will and divine energy in action and surrender to it. And therefore, you become the instrument through which it acts, flows through. And it's a dynamic surrender. So the joys and direction of the act is more and more consciously left to the supreme will and this universal energy. To that work, to that our works as well as the results of our works are finally abandoned. So to that, that in its two poises, one is as the supreme will, the supreme divine, other is as the Shakti who is doing all the works. It is to this we hand over everything, abandon everything the works and the results of the works, because it is that divine will that is set in motion all the works and it has its own divine goals towards which it is guiding and leading everything. So we renounce our egoistic aims and surrender to the divine will and surrender even the results and the works, everything to that. That's the beauty of karma yoga. So to that, our works as well as the results of our works are finally abandoned. It is not abandoned in the beginning. If we abandon in early on, we fall into our animal instincts and impulses and think that that is the divine. There is a purification required from the ego and it is in the final stages a complete abandonment and surrender to the divine will is possible. First is to learn to discern what is the divine will, what is the egoistic will, what is the will of various instruments within us, the lower nature and its impulses. It's not surrendering to our animal impulses in the name of being spontaneously surrendering to the divine. No, it is not possible. There is a purification of the will, the intelligent will, from its adherence to the egoistic will, will of the lower nature and its liberation, and then recognition of the divine will, which calmly works through everything as a vast movement, and to which we surrender. And then there is the freedom that comes with it. So to that, our works as well as the results of our works are finally abundant, not prematurely. The object is the release of the soul from its bondage to appearances and to the reaction of the phenomenal activities. There's this world of phenomenal activities where there is actions and reactions and constant turmoil and turbulence that is going on all around. So the object of object is the release of the soul from its bondage to appearances and to the reaction of phenomenal activities. The soul in its normal life, normal condition, is bound to this phenomenal world and its reactions and appearances. We are bound by the appearances and tied to its reactions and that world's convolute, messy, entangled work. And the more we become conscious of the divine will and attuned with the divine will, 
when we'll be liberated. So it is a release. So the object is the release of the soul from its bondage to the appearances and to the reactions of the phenomenal activities. Because every action has its consequence. Karma has its consequence. So karma binds. So to arrive at freedom without abandoning works, karma yoga is the path. Otherwise you arrive at freedom by abandoning works in the world. But to embrace work, we need to attune with the divine will. That makes the soul free from the entanglement and bondage to the appearances and this reactions of the phenomenal nature. So there is samatha to be established so that you enter into the calm will of the divine who is behind all things, acting through all things. And that brings freedom of the soul. Karma Yoga is used like the other paths to lead to liberation from phenomenal existence and a departure into the Supreme. That's the possibility of Karma Yoga. Like other two, the path of knowledge and path of love, both can move into absorption, into the that which is transcendent. Karma Yoga too can be used to step out of this worldly existence into the transcendent formless existence. That too is a possibility of Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga is used like other paths to lead to liberation from phenomenal existence and to a departure into the Supreme. Here is where the object of yoga, what is the aim of yoga? If the aim of yoga is set to be liberation into the Supreme, into the formless, if that is set as a name, then no matter what path you follow, whether you enter through knowledge, through love, even through works, you eventually find that as a means to go back and absorb into the transcendent, into the supreme. So what is the aim you're setting for yourself will make a huge difference in these paths. So even on the path of Karma Yoga, this absorption into that which is beyond the world is possible. But here too, the exclusive result is not inevitable. That's the promise of Sri Aurobindo. It is not inevitable. The end of the path may be equally a perception of the divine in all energies, in all happenings, in all activities, and a free and unegoistic participation of the soul in the cosmic action. So it can very well be the very perception of the divine behind all energies, all activities, every form that is moved by nothing but the divine consciousness and divine will. And the entire action of the world, entire social development and movement and nature's movements, everything behind all that, you see nothing but the divine. And you also realize you are a participant, a conscious center of the divine who is using you as an instrument in this cosmic play. And that is a dynamic union where you are not withdrawing from the worldly battle and action. Remember, Arjuna was given the wisdom of Karma Yoga in the battlefield where he was about to withdraw. And Krishna course corrects him and tell him, I am the one who is doing all this. You are only an instrument. And even this battle is my battle. I am the one who has slain everyone already in my consciousness. You are only executing my will in time and space. So these things become visible to the Karma Yogin and you can participate in the cosmic play of the divine. So at the end of the path may be Equally, a perception of the divine in all energies, in all happenings, in all activities, and a free and unegoistic participation of the soul in the cosmic action. Unegoistic participation, where you realize, I am not the one who is doing it, it is the divine who is doing it. 
doing it. For the ego, it is always, I am the one who is doing it. And it is, I, me and myself, the center of the universe. But for the soul who realizes the divine, it is the divine who is behind everything. So there is an unegoistic participation of the soul in the cosmic action. So followed, it will lead to the elevation of all human will and activity. Elevation of all human will and activity to the divine level. Just like knowledge is elevated, love is elevated, here all human will and activity will be elevated to the divine level. It's spiritualization and the justification of the cosmic labor towards freedom, power, and perfection in the human being. Just like there is a cosmic labor of knowledge, cosmic labor of love, there is a cosmic labor of will and power moving towards perfection. That will be justified when this realization happens in the dynamic union in the manifest world. So, so followed, it will lead to the elevation of all human will and activity to the divine level and its spiritualization. Our will gets spiritualized and justification of the cosmic labor. There is a reason why the nature is toiling, progressively evolving, manifesting new life forms and pushing humanity towards a greater perfection. What is the justification of that labor? Is it to get out of the manifest world? No, there is a greater perfection and there is a reason for this will that is set in motion of the cosmic labor towards freedom. Freedom even in action in the world, not just freedom in the transcendent, freedom in action in the manifest world. <clears throat> towards freedom, power, and perfection in the human being. That's a possibility. Freedom, power, and perfection in the human being. This is the promise of Karma Yoga. It's a possibility. And it's a wonderful possibility because there is a great integration with the worldly action. We can see also that in the integral view of things, these three paths are one. Three paths. Path of knowledge, path of love, path of works. From an integral point of view, essentially all three paths are actually one path. Divine love should normally lead to the perfect knowledge of the beloved and perfect intimacy. Because even if you enter through the path of love, eventually it can lead to the perfect knowledge of the beloved and perfect intimacy with the beloved. Thus, becoming a path of knowledge, you may enter through the path of love, but you begin to realize how the beloved works through the world and its cosmic play, and you get the knowledge of the world. Thus, it becomes the path of knowledge and to divine service, thus becoming the path of works. So you realize that there is the divine beloved who is organizing the world activities and you have get the knowledge of it. Therefore, you naturally move towards serving the divine. Thus, your will moves in action. So that is how the culmination happens through love when it is integral. So divine love should normally lead to the perfect knowledge of the beloved by perfect intimacy, thus becoming a path of knowledge and to divine service, thus becoming a path of works. There is a very beautiful, organic, natural synthesis, synthesis possible when we enter through that. So also, should perfect knowledge lead to perfect love and joy? Even when we enter through the path of knowledge, that also can lead to perfect love and joy. And a full acceptance of the works of that which is known. So, path of knowledge leads to the knowledge of that, the Supreme. And 
you are also discovering how it is working in the world. So the acceptance of the works of that which is known. You are getting to know the divine. Also getting to know how the divine works in the world. So also should the perfect knowledge lead to perfect love and joy and a full acceptance of the works of that which is known. Dedicated works to the entire love of the master, of the sacrifice, and the deepest knowledge of his way, of his being. So when we dedicate works to the entire love of the master, because when you recognize the master increasingly, when you enter from the path of works, you recognize through the union of the will with the divine will, you recognize how the divine is working things out. And you recognize the divine behind all things and then your gratitude grows, your love grows, and eventually it becomes the expression of your love for the divine and service for the divine. And you know how the knowledge of the divine, presence of the divine, how the divine works through the world, so whether you enter through the path of works, through knowledge or love, everyone will merge into these three paths, naturally will merge. Path will lead to knowledge and love. Knowledge will lead to love and works. No, love will lead to knowledge and works. So therefore, Sri Aurobindo says, these are essentially one path. So also should perfect knowledge lead to perfect love and joy and a full acceptance of the works, works of that which is known, dedicated works to the entire love of the master, of the sacrifice. Sacrifice is the yajna. Every work is seen as an offering, as a consecrated offering. The Vedic symbol of yajna is essentially this yajna of the cosmic life in which there is the living fire of the divine in all towards which every activity is offered. So the master of the sacrifice and the deepest knowledge of his ways and his being. The way of the master is known, his being is known. So all three naturally merges. It is in this triple path that we may come most readily to the absolute knowledge, love, and service of the one in all beings and in the entire cosmic manifestation. So compared to the Hatha Yoga, Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga, Sri Aurobindo is saying it is this triple path which is much more integral. And here is where we come nearest to an integral approach to the divine where a larger synthesis, a larger harmony, a larger perfection of all parts of our being is possible. So it is in this triple path that we come most readily to the absolute knowledge. Absolute knowledge, we get to know the ways of the divine, love and service of the one in all beings and in the entire cosmic manifestation. There is an integration of that which transcends the world and the world of manifestation, the world of multiplicity and the world of the formless one. One and many coming together. So in triple path, there is the knowledge, love and service to the one in the world of many, that become possible. This is where it is nearest, according to Sri Aurobindo. So he has covered now in this chapter, we have come to the end of this chapter. So you see, he has covered five paths, Hatha Yoga, Raja Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga. And out of that, he is saying this triple path is coming nearest, even though they have a possibility of an exclusive concentration on the transcendent, it is possible for an integral approach through the triple path. And uh, so with that hint from him, 
we are ending this chapter. In the next chapter, he will be taking up the synthesis, the integral approach. So thank you for being with me in this journey. I hope you're enjoying. Please share your learnings, your aha moments. That would be lovely. It will also help others to read your comments and learn from you. See you the next episode. Thank you. Thank you.